Yeah, yeah, you can. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah. Welcome, everyone, in the Vasavi Research Club number 17. And I'm very happy today because today, finally, we are going to go through the go through our research the cryptographic primitives of our research and if you have not paid attention to the last two episodes then pay attention today because this is going to be the final scheme that we have came up with and this is what's going to be in bitcoin in a couple of years time maybe two weeks <laughs> anyway <laughs> Just a quick overview on, on what we are doing right here is that uh, in Wasabi we would like to replace the mixing protocol in order to make the mixing, uh, well, a couple of things to fix about the mixing. For example, we could uh, remove the minimum denomination, we could uh, reduce or maybe completely make the change disappear in the mixes uh, we could have more blockchain space efficient mixing and we could also make transactions in the mix and how that this this these ambitious plans here um, requires us to be able to break coins down or merge them together in any way, shape or form. And when I'm talking about coins here, I'm talking about off-chain coin join coins, which is star which is being which are living between the input and the output registrations of the coin join phases. So that's the big picture here. And we have a uh, roadmap and I would like to give the word to Istvan or Yuval uh, who would like to start. I think Istvan should take it. Yeah, but uh, before we are going deeper, like a small correction that this is not our scheme. So we are uh, standing on the on giant's shoulders. So we just give slight modifications to the existing schemes. Uh, so, yeah, our added value is, um, I, I would say, almost negligible, like just with an epsilon. Uh, anyway, so first we want to provide some lightweight background um, because we understand that there might be some newcomers who join the research club or are not that familiar with this, key, uh, with this scene. So maybe we should start with uh, commitment schemes, like just a really quick over, uh, review, right? Or, uh, um, yeah, shall we start with uh, commitment schemes, Yuval, or, or? Yeah, I think that's the most logical place. I okay. think commitments are the most sexy things, so yes. Um, so like, it's not that important that the, that the viewer knows any instantiation of a commitment schemes, uh, it, the viewer should just understand that um, we have two algorithms, uh, this commit wait, algorithm. Wait, don't you want to explain the commitment scheme with my article? That should be really fun. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, oh, wait a sec. So medium, no para, uh, yeah. I mean, this is a special type of commitment scheme, but yeah. So, but but before going into this, like, let's just give um, an overview that, so we have a function which is called commit, um, and it allows one to commit to a message B with the randomness R, and uh, this algorithm outputs uh, a so-called commitment, which is denoted as C, and then later, it allows the committer to open this commitment and um, anyone, so this is called opening a commitment and they can check whether this opening of the commitment um, is correct. So what this achieves, this commitment scheme is that one can think of it as someone puts 
a pan in a box, as, as uh, Adam says in his example. And then later, once, once someone put in this pan into a box, then they cannot change their mind. Um, so this is called uh, binding property. But we also want that if someone just has a look, have a look at the box, then they should not be able to tell what's inside the box, uh, what's inside the commitment, what message was committed. And this property is called hiding. And uh, yeah, pretty much that's, uh, in, that's I think, uh, suffices to have, or Yuva, do you want to add something for commitment schemes? And um, yeah, so maybe we can move forward to Max, if, if there's no any uh, comment to commitment schemes. I guess maybe just so opening a, a com the to finish the analogy, opening the commitment is like opening the box. You after you promised, you show everybody what you put inside the box in the first place. And the most familiar example of commitment schemes are uh, hashes with a random string added because there's a, a, a difference from just hashes to commitments. If you commit to the same message twice, normally you don't want to reveal that you committed to the same message twice. So that's why you add more randomness and it's not just the message. Yeah. So like commitment schemes are like cornerstones of crypto, um, but I, I suppose like 99% of the audience already heard about them. So let's move forward to um, where? Lindell on Max. Ah, okay, Lindell. So this is like our Bible. If you are into crypto, then most likely you already um, are familiar with this book by... Um, Yuda Lindel and uh, Jonathan Katz. Okay, so what is an HMAC? Um, an HMAC provides basically data integrity on messages. So if you know what is a digital signature, you can think of an HMAC as the symmetric key counterpart of digital signatures. So one can produce with a K key an HMAC on a message, and then later this uh, so-called um, MAC stands for message authentication code. This tag can be verified with the very same. Um, so note that for issuing this MAC and verifying the MAC, the same uh, key needs to be um, taken. So this is like a symmetric key counterpart of digital signatures. So this does not provide public verifiability, but still it ensures that um, the message sent along with the MAC ensures that the message was not modified um, on the on the wire. Um, right. And HMAC is like, uh, I think, one of the most important and famous instantiation of Macs. But in Wabi Sabi, we rely on a different Mac. Um, right. Anything I should add to Macs? So if there's nothing I should add to Max, then maybe we can move forward to the signal paper. So what, what did you say? Just just a question. Uh, Mac is the symmetric uh, part of what, what was that? Yeah, OK, so like um, just think of like this would be if this would be a digital signature scheme then here okay you have a gener key generation algorithm you generate the public key secret key and then for example here instead of a mac you would have a sign algorithm which and which usually takes this the secret key as an argument and then it produces similarly not a tag but we call it a signature and then later, the verification algorithm in case of a digital signature scheme takes as input as the public key of the issuer of the signature. Uh, so there's an asymmetry. So in a digital signature, only the a secret key holder can produce digital signatures, but the public 
can verify the validity of the digital signature given the message and the signature. Uh, and here, only those people can verify the validity of the Mac who has accessed this uh, this key. So this is kind. Of, this is um, a relaxation of a digital signature, or yeah. So this does not provide um, public verifiability. And each Mac is the most popular Mac. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, in Wabi Sabi, we we will use and apply um, a so-called algebraic Mac. Um, and like this was, I think, the most in, uh, important observation what Yuval made, that we don't need, don't really need blind signatures or si- digital signatures at all, because in a in a mixing, if you apply a coordinator, then you don't really care about public verifiability. Um, because only the coordinator should be able to verify these credentials. Um, yeah. So this, this, makes sense. This, was, this was the most important um, observation, I think, so far, that we don't need this asymmetry. The coordinator issues credentials, and then only the coordinator needs to verify it in output registration, but now I'm, I'm getting uh, too forward. By the way, credit where credit is due. Uh, I did realize that, but then I ignored the literature on uh, Max f- for this because I thought it was uh, mostly relying on bilinear groups. So it's uh, Jonas Nick again for like the third time. We have to thank him for uh, 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 reminding me to to. Or correcting my misunderstanding and reminding me that I should take a, a closer look at that. Can, can I ask another thing that if the Cayenne does not need to verify, uh, then I mean, in, in Xiaomi and CoinJoin, at least the client needs to verify that the signature is correct. Uh, what what's the, what's the thing here? Also here, we'll get into it later. I think it's it's part of the that that's addressed as part of the protocol. Um, but I think we should save that detail for uh, after we we go over the definitions that we're going to use because we we need those definitions too. But the short answer that still in this case, um, the coordinator can convince the client that it gave out a correct Mac on, on the message. So basically, that's the answer. Thank you. And, and not only that, that all the users have a Mac issued by the same key. So uh, the coordinator cannot produce um, different like tags for, sorry, that's uh, an overuse, overloading of terminology. So that the coordinator cannot use a different key for each user in order to de-anonymize them later. Uh, it has to to prove that it's um, making use of the same announced key. So, uh, anyway. Thank you. The only thing you forgot to say is to spoiler alert, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's move to the signal paper, right? Um, or do we want to maybe cover, um, not this, not, uh, Sigma? You, which one shall I? Shall I think... Do? I think first we should go through the pre- preliminaries of the signal paper. Um, and then if people want to go over uh, zero knowledge proofs and the notation, then the first two pages of uh, Dambard's introduction to signal protocols yeah, uh, I mean, just as a really nice example. So we can, uh, depending on how it goes, we can either skip that or, or not. Yeah. So anyway, if you are dear viewer, if you're new to this space, like these two um, introductory texts are your best friends. So Sigma protocols and commitment schemes and zero knowledge protocols. But going back to the signal paper, so here. Page six, I think. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, this is not that important, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, let's go over it because th- there were some confusions about like some of the feedback that we got. So we might as well define this terminology because we use it later. It shouldn't yeah, take. I mean, it's basically okay. So we are working on a um, finite cyclic group. You can think of your favorite uh, elliptic curve, 
Um, so this G denotes the points, the set of the points on this elliptic curve. Usually in crypto, we use the prime order, uh, prime order elliptic groups. Um, yeah, and and we have this additional three functionalities, which allows to map arbitrary. Uh, this means arbitrary bit strings to to group elements. So we we should just accept this as a given that such functions exist. And then similarly, we can map. We don't uh, need those two. Yeah. Okay. So shall I just skip it? Uh. Yeah. I think so. Okay. So we have this. And then uh, I, I think this is the important uh, stuff. So now let's introduce what is a Mac, or or more more precisely, what is a algebraic Mac. So again, we have this beloved uh, elliptic curve group, and then we have a key generation algorithm which outputs two scalars in the in ZQ. So the the coordinators private key consists of two elements from zq z, uh, x0 and x1 then the coordinator um, that can generate max on a message m with the secret key by choosing a random point on the curve and then outputting well here they denote it as sigma so it's like already you can think of it as some kind of signature um, so this Mac, this algebraic Mac consists of two points, u and u to the x0 plus x1 times m. So the authors of this signal paper use uh, multiplicative notations. And then um, again, the coordinator can verify the validity of, um, of a Mac given uh, the coordinator secret key and the message by just basically recomputing it. So how can he recompute the Mac? So again, just applying the same formula, he will get uh, u double prime, and then he just needs to check whether u du double prime equals u to the x0 plus x1 times m. If this equality holds, then the Mac um, is correct, and the message was not modified, otherwise outputs valid, invalid. So, and then uh, we have a desirable, um, desirable security properties, um, right? So, but the, I, I think this I think is- can skip those. Yeah, um, let's- Just a it. minor note on the notation. Um, so here they write U and U prime, but later in the, the paper, they call it U and V. So uppercase U and uppercase V are... Yeah, so this paper honestly is a little bit mass. So we will, we need to write a long, long errata letter then. So we will do, don't worry. <laughs> okay, so now we know what is a commitment scheme, what are uh, max, algebraic max, um, what we need to know, maybe uh, here, just a few words about ZK, or, or shall we explain ZK here, Sigma? I think the definition at section 2.4, I think, is is uh, it's it's the same notation that we use, and it's pretty concise. Or, and yeah, right, right. Ah, this is perfect, indeed. Um, do you want to explain it, Yuval? Uh, I don't know. You're doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> or do, do you want to, are you tired already? No, 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 okay. So, uh, zero knowledge proofs, uh, these are magical create creatures, animals, uh, but they are not that, um, not that worrisome. So, um, but it, it doesn't say the algorithms it has. Oh, uh, anyway. Yeah. Um, Wait, what do you mean the algorithms? Like proof, verify, key gen. I was expecting oh. something different, uh, something similar, whatever. Um... I think maybe the original CMZ13 paper uh, has such definitions, but um, sorry, I didn't I didn't prepare that. <laughs> okay, so we have something here. So, um, okay, let's stick to the... Anyway, so a zero-knowledge proof system has basically uh, many algorithms, but let's simplify. It has two algorithms, a proof and a verify. So a prover wants to prove that a relation holds for x and w. 
So W is called a witness, and it's in it. The prover wants to keep secret the witness, so it doesn't want to publish publicize the witness. Uh, otherwise, it would be trivial to prove um, this relation. So how can we circumvent this issue? Um, so the prover generates a small proof pi, and then the verifier can, given x and pi, but not given the, uh, the witness, can verify that this relation holds. So this is basically the footprint of uh, a zero-knowledge proof system. And uh, here... Do we want to define relation, maybe? Because that's Ooh. yeah, so, it's so a little bit unintuitive. Yeah, the like in the first high, higher level, you can think of any relation just involving um, a predicate which uses x and y and some public values. Um, but for example, the most simple and like the grandfather of all zero knowledge proof systems is the Schnorr identification protocol, which allows to prove um, a prover that given y and g, it knows such x that g to the x equals y. So th this is called knowledge of discrete log uh, protocol. And, uh, or we can have another type of zero knowledge proof system, which is called the, op uh, the knowledge of opening of the Pedersen commitment. So here we prove that uh, without releasing, without le uh, leaking any information whatsoever about the exponents, that we know x and y such that z equals g to the x multiplied by h to the y. Um, right. And then we can combine such proofs uh, with logical and, logical or. Uh, right. And, but in our case, the most important is that a prover can prove that they know an opening of a commitment or in a, or a generalized commitment. So if we have not just G and H as generators uh, comprising this element Z, but we have multiple generators, then a prover can prove the knowledge of all these exponents up here without releasing any information about them. Um, right, so this is kind of a very crude, very initial um, introduction to zero knowledge proofs. And now maybe we can go to Wabi Sabi if there is no any comments. And if if this is unclear, we can consider doing like the first page uh, or first two pages of uh, the Sigma. Um, I guess it's up to you guys to decide. Lucas, Rafael, what do you think? Uh, I, I don't know. It's a it's a document for for cryptography. Probably for implementing this, um, we need something different because I think the document is okay as as it is. If a cryptographer can understand it. Yeah, I think from an implementation no point of view, it's really enough if you just think of these, like, it just gives you two functionalities. You can prove something, and then you can verify um, some, some this, the validity of these proofs. So I think maybe this, is, this, this might be the closest and the most helpful thing uh, we can offer. I don't know if it helps. I think yes. it, actually I disagree here. I think if we do go through so like um let's let's quickly go through the Schnorr identification protocol as an interactive protocol. Uh and then uh I think everybody will recognize like uh Schnorr signatures. Um because this is how this, these things are made concrete and I think the important thing is just to remember that um none of the proofs that we require uh, need anything more than Sigma protocols. It's just that uh, it could be uh, more efficient. Um, and we also want to use the fiat Chimera heuristic to make this um, uh, non-interactive. Um, are you are you in favor? Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, if there's need, we can go over the short uh, identification protocol. Yeah. Okay. So here, uh, just one minor note is uh, in his example, he uh, discusses this of like just the integers mod 
P, some large prime. Yeah, but uh, but for our purposes, like uh, since uh, the finite field Z uh, sub Q is uh, also happens to be a group because every field is a group. Um, we can think of that as the elliptic curve in this case. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, so, shall we go over then? Yes, please. Okay, so we, again, we have um, a verifier has access to P as the uh, characteristic of the group, it doesn't really matter, G and H. And uh, the prover wants to convince the verifier that he knows such a uh, witness exponent, which um, which is, ra if, if we raise it to G, then we, ha we will have H. So the statement we want to prove is that G to the W equals H uh, in this group without leaking any information um about the witness okay so so again this is the statement we want to prove and then this is like um uh, zero knowledge 101 so if you will ever take another class in zero knowledge proof system then this will be most likely uh, the first or one of the first protocols you will see so it's a three move protocol first the prover chooses a random r in the group and sends a to g to the r to the verifier okay so p is the prover v is the verifier then we uh, wait wait minor correction in this case even though the the scalar field and the group are the same thing uh r is a scalar so in the elliptic curve case uh p chooses r from the the field of uh uh like the the prime the the finite field uh, whose order is the same as the order of the group. Yeah, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's really tough a little bit, but it, okay, I see. So we choose is a challenge E uh, um, from, from uh, it doesn't really matter, this group, and sends it to P, uh, and then the P, uh, the prover sends Z equals R plus E times W. So basically the prover masks the witness with this, uh, challenge E mod Q. So basically, this is kind of why the verifier will not learn anything about the witness. And then the verifier can check this equality here. And um, correctness. So from any zero knowledge protocol, we require um, three properties. Um, correctness. So if the prover knows such a witness which satisfies the relation, then the prover should be always uh, should be always able to convince the verifier. So like, it's super simple to see that um, this relation holds if the prover has the correct witness. Um, then we also require soundness from a proof system. So if the prover doesn't know such a witness, namely the prover w w uh, wants to lie or tries to lie, then the prover should not be able to lie or with some, or only with some negligible probability. And then we also require zero knowledge, which is a little bit more technical uh, to formally define, but um, zero knowledge means that the verifier does not learn anything about the witness, um, which is the information the prover would like to keep, keep secret. So yeah, this is um, a three move so-called Sigma protocol uh, the way they are, the reason why they are called Sigma protocols, because, uh, maybe, is there anything like that? No, I don't think so. No, also, so it's, it's a bullshit meme. It, it should be called a Z protocol or something. It's, yeah, it looks like three rounds. <laughs> like if you, if you draw the lines or how to say the, if you draw the direction of the communication, then it, it looks like a Sigma. But but you is right. So no, it's more it looks like, like a Z. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So I think uh, is everybody comfortable with that? I guess. Or yes, because we are pretty familiar with that. So it's I mean, familiar. if you if you understand the so basically um, all the zero knowledge proofs, what we need in Wabi Sabi. 
uh, are really similar to uh, this 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 specific sigma protocol like they are siblings or brothers and sisters to this protocol so if you understand the uh, schnorr identification protocol then basically you almost understand all other sigma protocols <laughs> so that's good news and now we can maybe move forward to webisabi all if right Mm, okay. Or, or is there any question, comment, critic? There is none. Okay, so first let's just start with um, just the high level description of the protocol. Um, shall we also define input output credential attribute? Uh, would it make sense? I don't think so. Uh, me oh. neither. Okay, so. The user acting as valid submits her input value. And so, like, anytime we think of inputs or outputs, we just represent them as integers, at, namely their Satoshi value. Uh, so we abstract away any other information, such as uh, scripts, uh, script popkeys, etc. And whenever the user submits um, an input UTXO, uh, it also um, sends k pairs of attributes. So each input has k attributes, a value attribute, and um, a serial number attribute. And you should think of these attributes as commitment to these messages. So just by seeing MVI and MSI, you will not know anything about the underlying VIs and SIs. And so, and because the coordinator doesn't know anything about uh, these values, whether they are well-formed or not, the, the Alice also sends some zero-knowledge proofs to convince the coordinator that certain relations hold uh, for these MVI and MSI. Most importantly, we want to prove that the sum of the underlying VIs um, add up to this public uh, V in, and that, and and we also want to convince the coordinator then that we did not print any uh, money, namely that this MVIs lie in certain range. So you you should not be able to just uh, register twenty one million bitcoins. Um, okay. More importantly, if you come in with like one Satoshi and you register minus a billion Satoshi and plus a billion and one Satoshi, the sum is still equal to V in. That's why they have to be positive. That's how yeah. we <laughs> Um So I want to expand on this um, and say like not only are those attributes commitments, uh, we want them to be Patterson commitments because we want them to be homomorphic. Um, and homomorphic means that the sum of two commitments is the same thing as um, a commitment on the sum of the two messages. Um, and this is also why we use an algebraic Mac, because uh, the algebraic Mac kind of preserves these nice properties. And if we didn't do this, if we didn't use Patterson commitments and algebraic Macs, uh, those that zero knowledge proof of the sum would be much much more complicated. It could not be a simple sigma protocol, or uh, actually, we don't even need a sigma protocol for that. The way that we defined it, but uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> okay, so let's assume that all all these proofs are are verified and they are valid. Then the coordinator issues uh, KMAX, message authentication codes, on the requested attributes. Um, and also, the coordinator needs to convince now the client, the Alice, that these max are well-formed, so uh, that the coordinator does not want to cheat uh, Alice. Um, okay, so now we just give a high-level overview, so we don't really describe um, how these attributes and, and the credentials look like. So let's move forward. Uh, or, yeah. Is there any questions to input registration? 
I mean, now we are really just having uh, just the glimpse of the protocol. We will go into the details later. Okay. So just exactly no. what gets transferred there. So the the MVN MS uh, the value and the serial number vector the commitments which are uh, arrays anyway. So those get transferred. The range proofs. Um, regarding the range proofs, uh, is it bullet proofs or just normal range proofs? I mean, uh, as of now, you can think of your favorite and most beloved range proof, but most likely, I suppose, we will Im implement the most efficient one, which is currently the state of the art is bullet proofs. Yeah. All right. And anything else that gets transferred? Some. Some and the small proof. proof, we call it like a sum proof, which convinces the coordinator that the sum of the committed uh, VIs add up to V in. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Anything else? No, that's it. You, you summarized it correctly. Okay, thank you. That's pretty simple. So like you can think of you have one Bitcoin and you register, you want uh, to have 10, 1, 0 0.1, UTX so outputs Bitcoin outputs then you request 10 um, um, credentials for these uh, group attributes actually I think you was said you, that uh, some kind of relationships has to be also proven uh, mm -hmm. on, on MV and MS uh, is that the are where you referring to the range proofs and the sum proofs or no, the sum, so you you don't prove anything uh, with regards to the serial number. You don't really care because um, the 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 Alice cannot cheat there. So it's Alice's. Um, mm, yeah. Wait, but, uh, so uh, yeah, Alice cannot cheat anyway. So we don't really care about the serial number commitment, but uh, we only care about the value commitment. And uh, we, each individual MVI, we, we require a range proof and we require this sum proof. Uh, I, I don't think there's any um, ZK we require for MVI and MSI. Um, is there anything like that, you will? I don't think so. I think in the version 0 0.1, we still wrote that uh, the, there should be a proof of knowledge of the opening of the serial number commitment, but yeah, yeah. decide that it's it's not uh, contributing anything. I mean, if, if the user doesn't know the opening of the serial number commitment, then that's her fault. So, but yeah, we could require something like that, but um, I don't think... I mean, the, the worst that could happen is that Alice sabotages the protocol by registering an input that she can never uh, open. But that's the same thing as refusing to sign in the end or refusing to register an output. So it's it's the same like unsolvable denial of service of Alice disappears. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So okay, what is an output registration? Um, now with an yet another network identifier. Um, Acting as Bob, Alice comes along to register her output, the user, and okay, so now comes the fun part. Previously, we had commitment. Now, Alice randomizes the commitment. Um, maybe the viewer doesn't know what it means, but it's okay. We will explain it later. And uh, by randomizing this, these attributes now alice makes these attributes unlinkable to the previously uh, seen attributes by the coordinator and that, that, that's the rational between behind randomizing these attributes but still alice can convince that even though these attributes are randomized still alice can convince or bob if you wish can convince the coordinator that um, these are valid credentials issued by the coordinator and uh, that's that's where we also use this algebraic Mac or or the signal paper most more precisely and uh, yeah 
I want to clarify a small thing because there's a slight mistake here uh, we need to fix. So uh, it says uh, a valid credential, but it's any number of credentials. So uh, the whole point of this is you register each input independently and you get several credentials for each input. And then you go and you pick and choose whatever combination you want for every output registration. Uh, so every user can in, uh, register several inputs and can register several outputs and no input should be linkable to any other input or output and no output should be linkable to any other input or output. Yep. And we, again, in the output registration phase, we will require some zero knowledge proofs. Um, what properties should Alice convince the coordinator about um, so let's start with the serial numbers. Alice will just, or Bob will just uh, reveal these serial numbers. Okay. Um, that, that's where we will have um, double spending protection. Can I, can I ask? Yep. The serial number stuff, uh, as far as I can see, uh, wouldn't a simple blind signature scheme could work with the serial numbers or or not? Mm, I think the effect is the same or, or what would be the gain? No, I'm, I'm just asking that uh, is, is that something swappable? I don't think yeah. there is a gain because right yeah. now we are using the serial numbers for as as we are using it for the exact same. Yeah, yeah. I, I think they are interchangeable. That's, that's uh, if I understand the question correctly, I think it's it's not possible because, I mean, we need the algebraic max stuff or something like the ACL scheme, which is a uh, 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 blind signature scheme with attributes. If we only do a blind signature on the serial number here, then nothing constrains uh, the user uh, to only use the same serial number with the same amount. So uh, by doing it with a single Mac that covers both of these together, the Mac is only valid if you expose the corresponding serial number to the the same amount. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is this is exactly what I was uh, I was looking for. That uh, okay. So the serial numbers and the values are actually connected together but but if mv in and ms M mvi and msi is blindly signed then this attack vector is uh, fixed right yeah and and that's exactly what the acl paper uh let us do right so there we have uh, a blind signature scheme with attributes and the attributes are exactly the same as um as here they would they're just patterson commitments um, uh, the difference is the randomization is uh, more complicated to prove things about. Um, the uh, signatures are larger. Uh, so here, a, uh, a MAC is a single field element and two uh, group elements, whereas in the ACL scheme, I think it's like an eight tuple of like i don't remember how many of those are group elements and how many are i think they're all group elements not that it matters because they're the same size there's uh, 32 bytes uh, roughly um so uh in the acl scheme i think is m much harder to, to understand than the algebraic max um so it like this is meant to be a plug and play sort of uh, sorry, a, a plug-in replacement for the ACL scheme, um, and, and in this sense, it is like the the blind signature scheme with attributes gives us exactly the same thing. It just also provides a public verifiability of these signatures, which we don't actually need. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Uh, let's continue. So again, and we need to prove uh, some relation between these um, attributes because the user wants to register um, an output with a specific um, Bitcoin value. 
and maybe this Bitcoin value is um, constructed using several other uh, credentials. Uh, so again, here we will need uh, uh, some proof. Um, these are all spelled out in the paper, so don't worry, uh, the crypto details will come soon. And then, uh, yeah, that's it. We su the user submit all these proofs and then we the coordinator verifies these proofs and the output registration is uh, is, is done, basically. Uh, signing phase is, is pretty much uh, the same. The, user, uh, the same as in current Wasabi. So the user just checks whether her desired output is included in, among the output of the CoinJoin transaction. If this is the case, it signs the transaction and sends over Tor the signature if this is not the case, then the user aborts the protocol, right? Mm, let's go to the crypto details. If there is no question, if, is there any? I'm, I'm good. How about you guys? Yes, I'm good too. Okay, so phew, there's a lot of... Uh, parameters of the coordinators. So anytime you see G with some subscript, it, it's just a generator point. Uh, it's just an element, a point in the elliptic curve. And more, most importantly, no one knows the underlying uh, discrete logs, pairwise discrete logs. No one should, should be able to, to know this. And then uh, the... Um, Do we want to talk about the individual subscripts like at least uh, categorically i think so uh, w and w prime uh, are part of the uh secret key uh they're using the uh, keyed uh verification credential scheme x0 and x1 are the generators used for the algebraic mac so they correspond to x0 and x1 which are the part of the uh, secret key uh, in the algebraic Mac, uh, GV and GS, uh, those are our notation in the original paper. These are denoted GY0, GY1, uh, 2N. Uh, they're used for the, um, uh, in the Mac for, uh, verifying the attributes or sorry, for, uh, signing the attributes or tagging the attributes, I guess is the correct term. Uh, then we add G sub G and G sub H uh, for Pedersen commitments. Uh, and finally, there's G sub V, which is used uh, in the uh, verification of the algebraic Mac. Yeah, and this is the secret key of the coordinator. And um, yeah, maybe maybe we could change later the, from issuer to the coordinator. But in the document, uh, as of now, we use issuer and coordinator a little bit interchangeably. Um, yeah, so these are the public parameters of the coordinator. These are the secret parameters. And now let's move forward to the input registration. Can, so I, can I have a question from Lucas, actually? Uh, so these public constants, how would this look look in? How would this look like in C sharp code? Mm, uh, uh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. Well, in C sharp code, um, uh, it, it's just um, I don't remember the new uh, end Bitcoin library uh, but it is just a point right it's just you create a, a point in fact um i i saw a paper no no a paper a pull request on n bitcoin where there is a way to derivate uh, one point one generator from another generator but uh, in a way that you don't know the the 
how to go from one to another. I, I don't know how to explain this. It's a, uh, is it a hash function? That's usually the... the yeah, I mean, it, 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 uses, it uses like a, a hash function of the, of the previous one to generate the, the, the next one or something like that. Uh, I don't remember exactly the details. But in 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 end Bitcoin, for example, you have a, a sec sec p two hundred fifty six k one dot g big g. That big g, it's a electrocure point. I think the the class is called big e c point, and you have that. G, big G. There is the 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 generator. So it's basically uh, and Bitcoin use. Okay. I, for what it's worth, I think the traditional method to do this is called hash and pray, where you start by hashing a message. In this case, it could just be the variable name, and you use that as the x coordinate. And you check is this x coordinated uh, like on the curve? Uh, does it like uh, map to um, a, a, a corresponding y that's uh, on the curve? And uh, I think with like a probability one half, it should be the case for a CCP two fifty six k one. I suppose it should be like almost on because the character is. Oh, yeah, yeah, because the order is very close. Sorry, my uh, bad. Uh, yeah. um, like if you have 256 bit, then this is like pretty close to one. Yeah, yeah. For some reason, I thought the the order was uh, two to the 128 for a sec. Um, uh, my bad. Yeah, because uh, the rows I forget whose row algorithm is like square root of n, right? So for a security parameter of 128, you need 256, a group order of two to the 56, more or less. Never mind. Uh, that that's not relevant. Anyway, um, so uh, and then sorry, if it's not on the curve, just, then you just, just a second. Uh -huh. Sorry, just a comment. In the chat, uh, there you can see how in C sharp it could be. I mean, it's just an an elliptic curve, and and that's it. I I see. That's very useful, actually. Thanks. I I was just not sure how. How low we can go? Do we have these building books already, or or not? Is it guaranteed that the discrete log is not known between these? Uh, we can. I, I mean, we can find a, a way to derivate one from the 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 other one, or we can just select. I don't know. I, I I couldn't feel comfortable uh, selecting the the values by by anyone. So the, the the way that the signal paper defines it is that hash uh, to point function I think it's called, and the you just hash the variable name, take that as the oh. x coordinate. Oh oh yes that that okay yes that that's that's a good way. Yeah, and if way. it's not a valid curve point, then you just append like an integer, or you increment an integer, right? Like do the variable name, the variable name dot one or something. Try to hash that. If it's still not working, hash point two, and soon enough you find a point. That's the hash yes. and pray method. Uh, I I I feel I feel okay with that. I mean, if if it's, it doesn't exist the point, try with the the next one. Yes, it's. It's a good way. Uh, my bad. So this this is just the characteristic uh, of the scalar field, and this is the actual uh, size of the elliptic curve group. So it's very close, though. Yeah, yeah, it's still close. So like, uh, if you divide this with two to the two hundred fifty-six, it's pre still it will be pretty close to one. So the hash and pray method should output you almost instantly this uh, almost in instantly a valid point on the curve. Yes, I I've never I never seen a point that is a a, a number that is that that give me a, an invalid point. <laughs> All the points I I've tried I it's always valid. <laughs> 
Nice. Okay. So let's go back here. Oh, part of the the subtlety of the hash though is we need to convince the users that the the coordinator did not generate these points maliciously. So, um, it's okay. it's not just choosing a point. It's you need to choose a point that everybody knows is safe. Uh, or maybe we can hash the first I don't know ten words of the white paper, and then we will have some points on the curve, so it, it should be fine. <laughs> because you discussed the function earlier. It's called hash to g, and it's just a definition, right? <laughs> yeah, we can also take that. Okay. So let, let's go to the input registration because it's, it's pretty simple. Do we want to discuss the parameters though? What they mean? Uh, C, C, W, and I, or, or which one? Yeah. Um, it's a little bit unintuitive, but like what they do is they uh, allow. Th this is used as part of the credential verif. Uh, okay, never mind. Let's let's do that later after we do the show protocol. So uh, mm -hmm. just remind me to, to go back to the parameters. Yeah. So we want we have um, input UTXO with value v in. And we want to break it into k inputs uh, with value vi. So to that end, we submit k uh, Pedersen commitments. So mvi is a Pedersen commitment to vi, namely uh, g to g sub g to the rvi. So this is the blinding factor, and this is g sub g to the vi. So this is a commit, Pedersen commitment to VI blinded with RVI. Okay, so we have K commitments to VI. Similarly, we have K commitments to the serial numbers. So K Pedersen commitments to the serial numbers, and for each value commitment, we also include a range proof, which says that I'm. I have a commitment, which is basically a point on the curve. Um, it's a commitment to VI with some uh, randomness RVI. Th these are the witnesses. So I'm not going to tell you the witnesses, but I will be I will be convincing you that still the underlying value lies in the range. So it's less than say. 21 million bitcoins. Um, so it's not some negative value. So we don't, you don't know, you don't need to know how such a zero knowledge proof system looks like. We just need to accept that such an animal exists. And then, uh, okay, so we were able to prove that the commitments are well formed. Now we need to convince the coordinator that the sum of the um, some of the VIs add up to the claimed registered v, uh, input UTXO. How can we oh, do that? Yeah. Just a comment. Uh, um, the you, I don't know if you said that the RBI and RSI, the blinding factors are chosen randomly. Or, yeah, yeah, or yeah. That's right. That's right. I, I forgot to say. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. You are absolutely right. Yeah. If they are not chosen randomly, then uh, Alice is screwed, and uh, and the uh, coordinator could de-anonymize Alice if the values are not padded here. Okay. So this some proof. Uh, this is super simple. We apply the same trick we already described several times in previous WhatsApp Research Club videos. So it's super easy how to how we can prove that the sum of committed values in a Pedersen commitment equals a public value. So we just need to um, so the coordinator can just calculate the product of the value commitments, and the product of the value commitments will be. Uh, GG to the sum, uh, sorry, GG uh, to the sum of the, yeah, to the sum of 
the randomness values, the RVI, the bl blending factors, and the GH to the V in. So basically, this is the this if this equality holds, then um, Alice indeed convinced the coordinator that the sum of the committed messages add up to V in. Yeah. Also, not this is not a zero knowledge proof. It's not a sigma protocol either, but it could be. Um, for our purpose, like if you, since when you reveal a sum of random numbers, uh, you don't reveal anything about the original numbers. Um, and those are just blinding terms. Uh, this is still what's called uh, witness hiding. Uh, but it's um, strictly speaking, it's not uh, zero knowledge. And the uh, like, we could do it zero knowledge by making a sigma protocol that proves knowledge of the sum and like eventually shows. So we would do like G to the to the pi uh, sum. Uh, and then prove that this commitment plus the other commitment uh, opens to a commitment to VN or something like that. Um, we don't see a reason why that that needs to, uh, to to be a sigma protocol. So just to clarify that the this pi term is is literally just the sum of the exponents. Yeah. Okay, so we have the sum proof, which is pretty simple, pretty standard. We discussed it several times. What is missing from the input registration is that um, now the coordinator accepting and verifying these proofs, the coordinator should give out these valid max. And uh, so for each, for each, so this is the message the coordinator is um, signing, if you wish. This is not a signature, but uh, a MAC. And the coordinator will convince um, Alice that the Mac is well formed. So, like, without this zero knowledge proof, it would be really bad because maybe Alice just got get some um, garbage from the coordinator, and we don't want that. So, uh, this is just a formal description how com how. Um, a formal description of a zero knowledge proof system that achieves um, convincing Alice that V is a, is a valid Mac with respect to these public keys, public parameters of the coordinator. Uh, yeah, because obviously the coordinator doesn't want to tell Alice the underlying secret parameters in the first place. So, uh, yeah. Maybe I, I was not that clear in explaining this, so Yuval could help me. <laughs> so uh, first, the T and U are also part of the Mac, I would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's true. And then um, this is this is exactly how the coordinator proves to Alice that uh, it's not um, uh, using a different key for each user so that it can de-anonymize them later. Uh, the The reason is because uh, C W and uh, I are published in advance. Um, everybody uh, should check that they get the same ones if they fetch at different times over different Tor circuits. Uh, so these parameters should be well known, just like the round uh, denomination keys uh, for the blind si signing are in the current protocol. Um, and then this proof convinces uh, Alice um, as a proof of knowledge that this was relative to the, the key. So Alice cannot use this to prove to anybody else that her Mac was derived correctly. Uh, or sorry, in this case, she can because this is probably going to be a non-interactive proof. So anybody could verify it. But if she does that, she reveals her Mac. So um, sorry, that was a little confusing. But the point is, Alice only learns from this proof that this is a Mac generated by the, the secret keys committed to by the parameters. Yeah. Okay. So with that, we conclude the input registration phase, and now we can move forward to the output registration, which is a little bit more complicated, but not that much. So 
now let's say Alice got altogether T uh, valid credentials, so T valid max. And now Alice just want to use in the first output registration, just S out of this T. Um, right. Yeah. So this this is in the first place what we do, and this this is called the show protocol, which is more um, ex in more detail explained in the signal paper. But it is even harder to understand in the signal paper because in the signal paper there are many typos and errors. Um, so we maybe this is the right place to learn it. And it's also more general. We only need a specialized version of it because we only use one kind of attribute. That's really true. So what, what's happening under the hood is that we have this uh, MVI and MSI commitments. Um, these are um, re-randomized, um, namely uh, re-randomizing uh, me means that it's multiplied with uh, another point on the curve just to look uh, just to make it look even more random. <laughs> um, and then we have this randomized commitment and uh, zero knowledge magic allows Alice to prove that he has a valid Mac on the re-randomized stuff or, or more precisely that he just show, she just shows the re-randomized stuff, but still can say that, look, I know a valid Mac behind these re-randomized things. Um, maybe I, I was again a bit clear, but basically yes. this is what's happening in the show protocol. Yeah. What is the, the, the V, the big V uh, in, is the last yes, uh, of the randomizations? Wait, uh, in, so that's, uh, that should be VI? I think that's fixed. Oh, VI, okay. Uh -huh. okay. And it's the last component of the Mac. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Ah, uh, so this is a typo for, from uh, our part? Yeah, I fixed it. I think you're using a, a, an old version of the PDF, maybe? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I fixed it. Um, okay. Sorry, I think I fixed it uh, in the like the Markdown work in progress branch. Okay. Uh, so I should I should bring that over to the overly version. Um, uh, uh, another question, um, T, because uh, the, uh, the the Mac has a component, a T component, but this T is the number of of Macs uh, or the component. A random scalar. Uh, it's a component of the Mac, and it's uh, mm, okay, uh, yeah. just a random a uh, field element. No, but but uh, Lucas makes a point here that we also denote the the number of uh, credentials Alice got. Yes. Oh shit. Okay, so T. <laughs> so this, this is T our is, point, Lucas. Sorry. Yeah, but a Ti is the one that comes from the Mac, and I don't think we ever use T again after this paragraph. Okay, so we should denote okay. something. Yeah, we should choose a different... Uh, because here's, there's a clash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. My Look bad. You, you have an eye like an eagle. <laughs> I try to understand. <laughs> yeah, but this is a valid point. Yeah, yeah, because this we is... We should call it like C times K or something instead of T. Yeah, okay. This is confusing indeed. Uh, so little, be uh, so little letters in the alphabet. We should have a longer alphabet, <laughs> I, or I don't know. Maybe we should use Hebrew letters as well. <laughs> like an infinite number. Uh, yeah, you, you have the Greek, the Greek alphabet, the the English alphabet, uh, the Arabic alphabet. Good. <laughs> Fuck that. Let's just use Chinese. <laughs> Let's use emoji. What? Why? Why stick to alphabets? Um, I, I think one th one important thing for the notation is anywhere you see uh, a subscript i, that means it's part of uh, like it's related to a specific credential. Uh, except where I made that typo with v. I'm sorry. So uh, at least that's a helpful intuition, though. It's just so difficult to write a, a perfect document. There will be always errors and typos. 
Well, one step at a time, right? <laughs> okay, so is there anything to add to this credential validity? So uh, this is where I wanted to bring up the issuer parameters. Uh, they're not just used in order to uh, convince uh, Alice that she got a valid Mac. They're also used uh, in here to generate the proof. So um, both CW and uh, I are used. Um, uh, sorry, no, only I in this case. Uh, and um, this value Z, um, Z is generated by Alice. It's kind of um, uh, generated one way. So Alice generates it by taking I and raising it to the power Z. Um, but the coordinator calculates I uh, in a different way. It calculates it from the randomized commitments and from its secret key. Yeah, but um, if you want, you can also just, as of now, think of this whole show protocol or credential validity as a black box. So Alice randomizes the commitment and proves that he has a Mac, uh, she has a Mac, which is valid, but not, not showing the Mac itself to the coordinator. Maybe, maybe hopefully now we explained it well. Yeah, I think it makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Yes, it's, it's hiding behind the script. You. Can you repeat that, Lucas? Looks like the internet is gone in Argentina. <laughs> oh no. Okay, so... You can ask it as a YouTube comment. <laughs> okay, so like, how can we prevent users overspending? Um, and then we have one, one less. Uh, no, just this, right? What do we prove here? Double spender? Ah, okay, but this is trivial. So, but this is also trivial, whatever. So overspending prevention. So um, the user has, the user has this S uh, credentials, and um, we want to prove that they add up to this output UTXO value V out. Um, so again, at, at this point in time, Alice has randomized commitments. Uh, this is CVI. CVI denotes the randomized commitments. Uh, a CVI is just basically MVI with randomized uh, with um, GV and the, by a user chosen uh, randomizing factor, ZI. Uh, but if we spell it out, then this point is essentially has three generator points. And in each generator point, we have uh, the exponents are essentially sums, sums of either ZI, RVI, or VI. And we want to say something about the sums of VIs. So this is pretty simple. If the coordinator uh, takes the product of these randomized commitments, then this is what we will have. Okay, so what we can do is we can just uh, open the commitment on GV and GG. How can we open the commitment with respect to these uh, two generators? Well, we just tell the coordinator the exponents corresponding to these generators. So essentially the proof, which is again not a zero knowledge proof, but rather a witness hiding, but this is just a um, small subtlety, uh, just a technicality. So the proof is uh, two um, scalar field elements, the sum of the ZIs and the sum of the RVIs. So <clears throat> um, hence, if we give these two group uh, scalar field elements to the coordinator, the coordinator can just raise GV to the 
first proof element and the gg to the second proof element and this is the value what bobs claims to be the sum so the right hand side can trivially be calculated either from the proof or is public knowledge and the left hand side is just the sum of the re-randomized commitments so if this equality holds then also the claim the statement what bob is trying to prove holds um right so this is this is it and so this is how we can prove um prevent overspending okay and then in, in the very end of the output re registration phase uh, we also want to uh, prevent double spending and uh, double spending is, is pretty similar double spending prevention is pretty similar to the previous zero knowledge proof we have um, as uh, re-randomized serial number commitments so again msi is a commitment to the serial number which is now re-randomized by the user so the re-randomized commitment looks like gs to the zi gg to the rsi and gh to the si so now the user needs to come with coordinate this is uh, a mistake in the uh this is because we moved the sections uh so this is uh redundant with the csi defined uh at 2.2.1 um it's exactly the same one uh, what's what's the point uh what's your point this one says she she randomizes the serial numbers again uh but that's she already randomized them to prove the credential is valid so okay. same I csi I just took it as a. I just took it as a reminder. Okay. I oh, know it's a an editorial mistake because uh, we move things around. <laughs> okay, so basically, um, the user wants to convince the coordinator uh, that given CSI, the user knows ZI, RSI, and SI, such that. Uh, so this is called knowledge of representation. Um, so the user knows uh, the representation of this point with respect to these three generator points without telling the underlying individual exponents. So we have such a zero knowledge proof system. You don't need to know how it works. We have it out of the shelf, uh, of the shelf. And, but in our case, um, what we also needs to do need to do is that we can uh, publicize uh, si because um, um that's how we we will um that so we need to public publicize si uh, the serial number uh, because otherwise we will not accept the output registration um yeah Basically, Concretely, it's it's pretty easy. Like you give the serial number and you give a Pedersen commitment to uh, not exactly, but like G to the Z, uh, G, sorry, G uh, uh, S to the Z I, uh, G G to the R S I, oh, yeah. and um, uh, prove knowledge of Z I and R S I with respect to that commitment, and the coordinator can can confirm that. This commitment times uh, GH to the SI is the same as the randomized commitment. Exactly, thank you. So basically that's, that concludes the output registration phase. And then we have uh, Wabi Sabi, at least in draft 0 0.2. <laughs> thank you. I would only have one note that in Chinese GG means penis. <laughs> <laughs> we okay, learn something every day. <laughs> oh well. So maybe hopefully we will have some Chinese yes, uh, viewers. 
Yeah, and they can correct me. <laughs> Bullshitting here. <laughs> I don't know. All right. Uh, thank you, guys. Um, maybe do you do you have anything you would like to talk about before we go? <laughs> All right. I take this as a no. This was a pretty intense session. I will definitely rewatch it a few times and hopefully I will I, understand more. I have maybe one last thing. So um, we can post it in the description, but I would uh, really recommend to uh, anybody who wants to read into this a little bit more. Um, the original uh, um, algebraic Mac paper um, I think is a, a, a very nice uh, read. Um, wait, let me give you a precise title. I'm sorry. Nico John Zaveruche paper. Yes. So uh, algebraic max and key verification anonymous anonymous credentials. This is where the stuff was introduced. Uh, so Melissa Chase, Sarah Michael John, and Greg Zaverucha whose name I keep forgetting. I'm so sorry, Greg. Um, and um, the signal paper takes this. Uh, there's two algebraic Mac algorithms uh, described in there. One relying on uh, the generic group model uh, for its security proof, and the other relying on decisional Diffie-Hellman. Um, so the signal paper uses the first one, uh, and extends it to uh, support uh, attributes where um, the attribute values are not just scalars, but arbitrary group elements. Um, I think it's uh, very well written. It's also got at the very end, uh, like after the security proofs, there's a, uh, a concrete instantiation of uh, the zero knowledge proofs um, for this uh, slightly simpler scheme. Um, so that's a really good reading, I think. Um, and also, uh, personally, I'm kind of new to this uh, zero knowledge stuff. So I found um, uh, Ivan Damgard's uh, introductory materials uh, really helpful. Uh, both this one uh, and the one on commitment schemes um, and zero knowledge protocols. Actually, this one was probably more helpful because... Um, it it really goes through the like the logic and the definitions. It uh, it's a very clear description of the difference between a proof, a proof of knowledge, zero knowledge proof, a zero knowledge proof of knowledge, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and also covers stuff like uh, uh, cryptographic simulators, which are uh, needed for uh, for all of this stuff, uh, both as a theoretical concept uh, and for the Abe blind signature scheme, you actually need to write a simulator. Um, so it's really helpful to understand how the Abe blind signature scheme in the ACL paper we discussed, uh, like why that even works. Um, anyway, so those would be my reading recommendations. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I have a, a question. Uh, you said that um, given we are creating this this max from the commitment or the value commitment and the serial number commitment, you said that this is the max to that we need to use because this preserves the um, uh, homomorphic um, uh, what. Sorry, I I I I don't I, I lost the word, but the 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 property of homomorphism homomorphism of the commitments, and where are we using that again? So, um, uh, well, why do we have to preserve that? Um, just just to making this um, edit proofs easier like we just want to make our lives easier so if we have these nice uh, properties then for example this overspending prevention like proving sums becomes like almost trivial um yeah so we we use it implicitly in these sum proofs and also in input registration phase um yeah you can imagine something that uses an hmac 
Uh, but then doing the zero knowledge proofs would become uh, really complicated. You need something like uh, zk snarks or zk starks or something like that. Uh, do like arbitrary arithmetic circuits, and the proving time is going to be really long, and the proofs are going to be uh, yeah. It's it's just uh, probably requires a trusted setup. So um, that's like the the main advantage is it makes the all the zero knowledge proofs uh, extremely simple on the same sort of complexity as just the Schnorr signature. Even the range proofs, I would argue, are, are still as simple. Uh, it's just the same idea, like, repeated multiple times, and in bullet proofs, uh, they make it much more efficient by um, doing it, like, a, that there's a, a cool recursive trick, but conceptually, it's still very much like a Sigma protocol and not like one of the more uh, general purpose um, zero knowledge proof systems. Okay, uh, one, one, one more. Uh, it seems to me, I, I'm not sure, but it seems to me that the, the harder computation is performed by the client, or I mean from, the, from Alice, right? Not from, or, or both, not from the coordinator. But Anyway, uh, do you do you have any any idea of how uh, how hard these computations are on the server side, in the, on the coordinator side? Um, how many um, elective curves uh, multiplications? Let's say. Well, I, I cannot really give precise numbers, but all of these proofs are like super lightweight, so. Uh, I I think it, it's just a question of uh, milliseconds, so I, I'm not afraid at all. It, I think the most expensive part is the range proofs, because uh, in the range proofs you need to do a binary decomposition. Um, so there's like a, a vector commitment to the individual bits. Uh, and uh, like you need to compute the inner product. Um, and I think that's uh so th that would be like i think 51 if we use 51 as the range um uh times i guess it's like four multiplications and then like you can make it into a, a giant multi exponentiation um yeah. it's, but it's it's basically o of n in the the parameter of 51 and there's a a protocol uh, so somebody linked on uh, on the Slack channel. Uh, if you go, uh, Ishvan, uh, very quickly to lightweight.money. So this is the Danake, I think it's pronounced. It's uh, like a Greek word. Um, this is a very similar idea, but it uses um, the older algebraic max scheme. And it uses Elgamal encryption. Uh, and uh, blind issuance. Uh, so I would say it's ever so slightly more complex because of the blind issuance than the newer signal scheme. Uh, and he has uh, concrete uh, performance figures um, that I think should give us at least an order of magnitude estimate. It's item nine. Uh, okay, so, so in, in your opinion, the 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 range proof, uh, requ I mean, it requires the the inner product of the each of the fifty one bits for what's the other element? I, I, so I, I'm the way the range proofs work is um, you yes. make a commitment to um, like. I, I actually I don't know how the commitments in bulletproofs work uh, exactly. I need to review that. But um, I as far as the like the the statement being proven, you do you take a, a vector that's like some generator, uh, the the same generator for the commitment value, uh, to the power uh, uh, zero to the power one uh, to the power two. No, sorry, you do two to the power. Uh, like zero, one, two times that generator, and then you you so you have these um, generators that are the same for everybody, uh, and that's just like a vector of the powers of two, and then you compute the inner product of uh, 
a, another vector which is zero or one uh, for every binary digit in the amount. So you do like uh, zero or one times the first generator for you know the first digit, zero or one times the first generator, the second generator for the second digit, and so on. And then um, the inner product of this should be equal to the Patterson commitment of the amount. And then you also need to prove for every one of your uh, bit commitments, uh, you need to prove that it's um, uh, uh, exactly zero or one. And the way that you do this is you take the, the commitment times, uh, I think the, com the, sorry, the commitment witness, the value uh, times um, uh, one minus that. And uh, this would be uh, zero for uh, like if the bit is zero, then zero times one is zero. And if the, the bit is one, then one times zero is zero. But for every other value, it's going to be a uh, non-zero. Um, so like you, you take all of this stuff together in like one giant polynomial and um, uh, like that gives you eventually a commitment to zero. Uh, and that's what like ensures uh, the validity of, of all of this. And, and the bulletproof stuff like you can do this as a sigma protocol, but the bulletproof stuff um, uh, does something like really clever where um, they they basically do uh, like the, the recursive decomposition of, of this problem. Um, and like they add, if this was an interactive protocol, it would take log n interactions, but with the Fiat Shamir heuristic, you can still make it non-interactive. Um, and uh, so the the prover and the verify still do O N work like they would in a sigma protocol, but the actual resulting proof size is uh, only logarithmic. It's it's very small. Uh, hopefully that that makes sense. And uh, just as a caveat, I'm like I barely understand that stuff. Like so so uh, I probably made some okay. mistake there. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm I, I'm just asking this because. <sighs> I see a lot of um, operations, uh, and the, the server is one, only one that has to to do this for every for every user for every single uh, mm, pair of commitments, and uh, we we have now the 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 C or C plus plus performance with C sharp in this kind of stuff, but. I'm just, I just was curious. Thank you. I think, so if we compare it to that uh, lightweight money scheme, the Danaki scheme, um, the credential that like we have is very similar to what he calls a, a token, not a wallet. So a token spend is very similar to a um, output registration and a, um, uh, I think he calls it a wallet top-up, or um, like uh, that's very similar to input registration, but a little more complicated because uh, it requires uh, like another proof. And he uses uh, bulletproofs for everything, and the um, uh, the performance figures that he gives. Uh, this is on uh, a curve two five five one nine in Rust. Um, um, it's still only a few milliseconds per uh, per operation. Um, so if we take that as a, like an order of magnitude, let's say you know it's ten times slower. Um, uh, I, I still think it's uh, very reasonable for uh, a fixed number of of participants. Like um, th this should be like n not more expensive than say like the number of signatures you need to validate a block or something like that in, in Bitcoin. So, I don't know. I mean, maybe like, I, I think I'm, I'm really overestimating here, but let's say it's like 10 seconds of compute overall in an entire round. I think that would, would probably be enough. Um, and uh, this stuff is like one of the reasons we prefer this over like bilinear groups and uh, ZK snarks and all of that. It's not just more uh, complicated conceptually. Um, it's also that those underlying primitives are not as efficient. Like for bilinear groups, you need uh, groups um, uh, with like a cofactor. Uh, they can't be groups of prime order. Um, 
because you need like cyclic subgroups inside of them so that's a like a bigger curve order and uh typically they're not as uh like the implementations are not as fast either um so i, I think from all the schemes we considered this should actually be uh, one of the more performant ones um even though it's it's still um probably uh a, a, like at least 100 times slower than just a plain blind schnorr signature all right thank you guys for today and like share and subscribe and as a goodbye let's hear some word from our sponsor be connected